So uh, my name is Avery. I am a software engineer at Facebook, and I'm here today to talk to you about a um, interesting uh, computing platform that was actually developed at Yahoo before I moved to Facebook called Apache Giraffe. This is just a quick agenda of what we'll be discussing today. First, I'll talk about why we need a graph processing platform and a little bit about the motivation for companies like Facebook or Yahoo to be investigating this kind of uh, framework. I'll be talking a little bit about um, the basic draft concepts like um, the BSP bulk synchronous parallel model as well as go into detail in the API. And the API is pretty straightforward and simple, so I think it'll be really helpful for people to get an idea of what draft can do. Uh, and then next, I'll be talking about some example applications. Uh, very simple ones because uh, we don't have limited time here. First of all, a shortest path, uh, I'm sorry, a maximum vertex value application and then the canonical page rank example that can be done in very few lines of code. I'll discuss the architectural overview at that point, as well as uh, the changes that were made since the last presentation. So last year we, at the Hadoop Summit, we gave a, a talk in introducing a, a, a giraffe into the Hadoop ecosystem. And uh, there's been a lot of changes in the year, and I want to make sure that uh, people kind of get a feel for what, what's changed, as well as where the future of giraffe is going. So Apache Giraffe is basically a loose implementation of Google's Pragle. And for you, a lot of you, that probably doesn't mean anything. Uh, but Pragle is a, um, a, something that was created at Google as a way of doing large-scale graph processing uh, using this bulk synchronous parallel model, which I will talk about in a, in a little bit. It's implemented as a map-only job in Hadoop. And if you were at a previous talk uh, with, with Josh from Cloudera, he, he mentioned it was a big hack on top of Hadoop. And that's pretty accurate, I think. Uh, it's a giant hack where we, we use map, we use Hadoop as nothing more than a research allocator. We steal their maps, and then we do a lot of communication and uh, fancy things behind the scenes. Um, the reason it was done this way was because we get out the door quickly, and we can deploy quickly. A lot of people have a lot of installed Hadoop uh, installations at their, at their sites, Yahoo, Facebook as well. And it's the fastest way we could get access to hundreds or thousands of nodes. The main idea behind Giraffe is the, the concept of thinking like a vertex. If you've done any MapReduce programming, you're familiar with like thinking about key value pairs as this atomic unit of programming. But in the draft world, in the graph world, we're thinking about as a vertex, you're doing some computation, you're sending messages to other vertices in the graph, um, and also doing some kind of aggregation as well. Uh, draft is also, can be considered to be a totally in-memory scalable system. We take your graph, we partition it, we send it, we have um, each map to load a certain section of that graph, and then um, we then send messages from one vertex to another using our partitioning strategy. Um, this doesn't work well for all cases. I mean, if your graph is too big or you don't have enough memory, uh, basically gonna fail, fail your job. I think one of the big features we're working on in the future is to at least have a way to have out of core messaging as well as uh, storing of the graph so that we can handle larger pr problem sets as well as handle the cases where your machines don't have that much memory. Um, as well. So the kind of, I guess, problem space we're trying to tackle right now, at least since I work at Facebook, is how do we handle gra large scale bulk graph processing on the social graph? Um, there are a lot of social networking companies, I've just listed a couple here, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and they have hundreds of millions to nearly a billion users, uh, which is a very large graph. And we need ways to be able to do uh, a lot of different kind of applications um, and I'll talk about the next slide. So you can think of, I mean, these are just some examples. There's lots of others, but the ones I think that we're primarily gonna be starting to focus on is this idea around popular posts or popular users um, and, and importance, perhaps, of what we should show you inside your newsfeed would be something that's really interesting to figure out. And then a lot of people maybe don't fill out, for instance, their location where they live, but we can kind of infer that based on your friends or your friends of friends and then use, um, uh, large-scale graph processing algorithms to be able to go ahead and, and infer that for uh, all the users that don't put it in there and with some measure of accuracy. Uh, we can do that not just for location, but like your school, your gender, other, other characteristics as well and provide you with more relevant information, better suggestions about like who your friend should be and what groups you should be in. And then there's this other class of, I would call it like uh, semi-structured like clustering, machine learning type things that you can do with Giraffe, try to figure out um, groups of people within the, within the social network, people that have common interests, and things of that nature, which would also be very useful. Okay, so bulk synchronous parallel. 
Uh, I'm just gonna try to describe the, the quick and dirty of what it is. The idea is that you take a very large application and you can break it up into a series of super steps. Super steps are like iterations in your, in your computation. Um, it, if you thought about it purely as MapReduce, you could think of them as like a series of MapReduce jobs that are happening. You have this global epoch, everything's, the state's totally saved. Um, there's no ordering on the computation that happens within a, within a super step per se. All you know is that at the end of the super step, all your stuff is then available, all your computation is guaranteed to have finished during that time. The next thing is you have point-to-point -point messages. So that means that any vertex in the graph can send a message to any other vertex in the graph, um, and there's no ordering again. The only guarantee is that those messages that were sent in the previous super step will then be available for processing in the next super step after that. And then each component has individually like kind of decides when they're finished with the application. And only when all the components or all the vertices in our graph are complete, that's when the application actually finishes. So I have a better picture, I think, that will make it a little bit more clear. So in this case, I've just kind of shown that um, we have, if you had this distributed, you have a, a notion of a series of processors. You would have each processor doing some number of work, crunching some number of vertices in the graph. And during that time, they might send communication to other workers where uh, the messages are meant to be delivered. And um, logically, it looks like this. Maybe in reality, you're sending messages while you're doing computation. Um, but the only thing that matters is there's a barrier at some point. And after that barrier happens, that's the super step, that uh, all the messages are then delivered to those vertices, um, to their target vertices at the beginning of the next super step. And they're available for doing some computation with. Okay. And if you think about it, really draft isn't that different from MapReduce. So in MapReduce, you, you think of like, again, these key value pairs. This is the example interface for map. Um, you do some computation on them, then you spit out some other key value pairs. Uh, draft, we work on the level of vertices. So uh, our types, um, type I in this case, I'm referring to as a vertex index. This is how you will uh, determine what, like if you're sending a message to a vertex, you need to know its, it's ID basically uh, of where to send it. We have a type um, V, which is the vertex value. So that's, uh, could be like, for instance, if we're ca calculating your high school, then it would be like your high school string maybe, perhaps. Um, e is your edge type. So e edge type would denote like the relationship from one vertex to another. It could be a weight in some cases. It could be other things. And then finally we have M, which is a messaging type. That's a, that, that basically determines um, what messages are, are sent from one vertex to another. And all these types you get to pick as a user. And um, to go along with the Hadoop model, we've just basically taken all their interfaces, writable, comparable, and comparable, and, and writable and reuse those. So you can use the same types you're used to in Hadoop, like in writable, float writable, long writable, all those things. And um, what we then do is you have this compute function. That's your job as an application designer. You, you implement it with whatever you want to do. Um, and you're given a message iterator. So this message iterator is basically gonna give you um, a handle to all the messages that were sent to this vertex in the previous super step. Um, and then within the compute method, you have, um, this is like kind of like summarizes most of the Giraffe API. You have a series of methods that are immediately accessible and then those that are available in the next super step. So the immediately accessible methods are things like getting the vertex value, you can set the vertex value, you can get your vertex ID. Additionally, you can start going along your edges. So we have a notion of a directed graph. You can check your neighbor, you can, you can look along your edges to your neighbors. You can also vote to halt. Volting to halt would be like um, when you've determined that your vertex no longer has to do any computation. And you can also check your, tate, your state, so if you've halted or not. Um, and again, once all the vertices are voted to halt, that's when the application is actually gonna complete. So uh, then we have a series of operations that can happen during the next super step, so, or prior to the next super step. So you can send a message to another vertex, that's, or send a message to all your edges, that's just like a helper method to make it easy. Uh, additionally, you can mutate the graph. So this doesn't need to be a static graph in any way, shape, or form. You can change it while the application is running. You can add uh, vertices, you can remove vertices, you can add, add edges on remote vertices and remove them as well. Okay, so I think it would be useful to go through a quick code example. Um, in this case, I'm showing what we would implement as a maximum vertex value. So if you, the, the idea is basically that each vertex in your graph has a value, 
And this only works for strongly connected graphs. But so suppose your graph is strongly connected, uh, then we can actually figure out, use giraffe to figure out what the maximum value is inside the graph. Um, so the first thing we do is uh, the first block or first code block where we say the while loop uh, doesn't apply for the first super step because there's no messages in the first super step. It's everything just loaded. And then uh, the next block, we, s we basically send our vertex value to all our outgoing edges. And, and then uh, during the next super step, we've received all the vertex values that are coming into us and we check. We say, um, do we receive a vertex value that's greater than the one that we have already? If we receive a greater vertex value, then we change our vertex value, and then we will send, um, send again the new vertex value across our edges. If we didn't receive a new vertex value, then we must be the biggest, at least for now. So then we vote to halt. So that vertex is then no longer part of the computation unless someone sends it a message in which it will wake up and then try to check again to see if it's the maximum vertex value or not. And this can actually implement, be implemented a lot simpler in Giraffe using aggregators, but I think it's an easy example for, for people to start with. So it's, this is a little bit more of a, a easier way to describe it, I suppose. So in this case, we have a very simple graph of three nodes, and we have two processors, uh, two nodes are on one processor, one node's on another one, and the uh, dark lines represent the edges in the graph, and um, the numbers represent the vertex value. So uh, the, the vertex has the, everyone in the first super step, everyone sends their vertex value to its, its neighbors. And we can see the vertex that uh, had the value five doesn't receive any greater value, so it says, I'm done. The vertex that was two doesn't receive any greater value because it only receives one. So he says, I'm done. And the vertex that had the value of one gets the vertex value five. And he says, oh, okay, I need to update myself and then send that new value along my edges. Uh, and then this kind of proceed, proceeds so that um, eventually the vertex that had the value two will receive the value five, and then he'll send his message out, and then finally everybody agrees that we all have the highest vertex value. Okay, so we also have a page rank implementation. I think this is probably the one that's used the most when talking about giraffe. It's something that's very simple to implement, and um, in this case, we have we start off by saying, um, well, the first code block ignored because we are on super step zero, but then we just send we have a page rank value initially, and we send it across to our outgoing edges. And in the next super step, then we start executing uh, the first code block, the if statement block. Uh, we basically take the messages, the vertex values. I'm sorry, the page rank values that are sent to us in the previous super step. We sum them. And then we do some damping factor on them to create a new vertex value. That's our new, that's our new page rank value. And then we just rinse and repeat this step until uh, a halting condition. You can make a nice halting condition in the sense that like, you could say, well, if my vertex value didn't change that much from the last iteration within some tolerance, that's when I want to halt. For simplicity, I just say, well, when we hit 30 super steps, we're done here. OK. So, Again, I mentioned that Giraffe runs as a MapReduce job. Uh, this is kind of what it looks like from the job tracker UI. You just see like a bunch of running maps, which we've hijacked. And um, in this case, we've actually also added a bunch of counters. So you can see like how long each of the uh, phases of Giraffe take. There's a setup time where we try to basically acquire all the map tasks first before we start any kind of computation. Then there's this vertex input super step, which is the loading phase where we load the graph into main memory. And then we have a series of super steps that are actually executing. And in this case, we're just doing the page rank benchmark. So like these super steps are taking, I don't know, 200 seconds or so to go through. Um, and in this case, we're looking at 2.5 billion edges, 62 billion ed, uh, messages, that kind of thing. So that's the kind of statistics you'll see if you're, you see a running draft job. So the first question you might ask is, uh, why not implement draft as multiple MapReduce jobs? It's, it seems like you could take this this language that we have and compile it down into a series of MapReduce jobs. Um, we could. And in fact, in some cases, maybe it might make sense. But uh, the problem is that typically we find this to be a little bit slow. Uh, we have to create a series of jobs. There's job overhead. We have to schedule it. Then we have to then load the data from the graph into map tasks. Then we have the spills. Then we have uh, the fetching of the data from the reduce tasks. Then they dump to disk. And they do sorting and shuffling. And then they finally then dump it to an input format. 
and we have to, oh, yeah. Oh, my wife is going to the OBGYN, sorry. Um, my apologies. Uh, it's important. <laughs> um, thank you. <coughs> sorry, okay. All right. Um, so that's a little bit uh, slow, I guess, for us. We don't, not, we want to handle those disks. We don't want to go through scheduling overhead. We don't want to do all these things that uh, we don't need to do, really. So in fact, again, as I mentioned, we implement it as a map-only job in Hadoop, in Hadoop, but we only use it for resource management. So what that means is we, we start a job, and we, don't, we, we set the input splits to the number of workers that we want. So if you wanted like 100 workers, we just say, OK, we're going to have 100 input splits. And we add a little bit extra for um, our, map, our master process, which I'll talk a little about later. Um, one more task or two more tasks, as many as you like. And uh, once we have those map tasks, then we start doing a lot of uh, different things, uh, which I'll get into. But the main, thing, the main point of this is that we, we only have a single job that does all these iterations. And that's why we get the performance boost, because everything's in a main memory. We used to use Hadoop RPC last year uh, for doing all our communication. That's pretty slow, actually, for sending billions of messages. So uh, we converted to using Netty-based uh, IPC, and that's a lot faster. Netty's pretty awesome. OK, so the draft components. We have three things that we do in draft. We have a master, which is the application coordinator. You can actually run more than one master. And what this allows you to do is uh, enable some fault tolerance. But we only have one active master at a time. This is handled with Zookeeper. Uh, the master is responsible for doing some part of the partitioning. So it calculates the number of partitions using some user-defined algorithm, or the default one we have, and then takes those partitions and assigns them to workers. Um, it does this prior to every super step, and based on some feedback from the workers themselves. It also is responsible for the synchronization of every super step, um, and will handle any kind of fault and failures and cases as well that arise. The workers are pretty straightforward. They're doing the loading and storing of the graph. They're also doing all the computation. They're, they're, they, have, they actually physically have the partitions of the graph in memory. And they're the ones iterating through all these vertices and doing the computation and then sending the messages, gathering the messages, um, all the hard work, um, using most of the memory, actually, of the system. And then finally, we have Zookeeper. Zookeeper we use uh, to maintain all our global state. It ensures that we only have a single master active at a time. It also coordinates the super steps, um, although we might go away from that because it's a little bit heavy. And we also already have a master. And um, uh, also maintains the health of all the workers. So it's the one that detects when a worker dies that we need to go ahead and handle some failure case. So one thing I want to talk about uh, this time, this year, was the, the changes we made to the graph distribution. So last year, the way the graph distribution worked was that we required that, um, so we, oh, something I should mention earlier, is that we load the data very analogous to Hadoop. So in Hadoop, you have a notion of an input format, and you have input splits that are generated by your input format. Uh, we have something very similar along those lines. We want it to be very Hadoop friendly. We have a vertex input format, and instead of loading uh, key val pairs like you're used to for Hadoop jobs, we load um, vertices. So it's very similar. Um, and the way we used to do it was we require that your vertex uh, input format had to have all the vertices sorted by ID. Uh, this made for a nice, easy way for us to do the partitioning, but uh, was pretty restrictive for other folks that don't want to sort their vertices in, in their graph. So we redesigned the graph distribution um, to be more flexible. The idea now is that uh, it works very similar to a dupe, kind of like, actually, like a, like, almost like a MapReduce job in the beginning. Everyone loads any parts of the graph. So they, they load their vertex input splits, and they don't need to be sorted. And then once you load the vertex, you know the ID, and then you send it to the partition that actually owns that particular ID. So it's like kind of like a, a MapReduce job in some sense. Um, and, uh, and we also changed, made some interfaces, I guess, for graph partitioning to customize. So actually, the partitioning part is the very, probably the hardest part of, of building this kind of a system. And um, so we, we provide something by default, which is like a hash partitioner. So you have your vertex ID, your index. And we, right now, the default is that it takes the hash code of the value. 
and then hashes with the number of partitions that we have in the system, and that's the that's a that's how you figure out which worker to send your your message to, or which which worker actually owns this vertex. Now, this actually works pretty well for uh, when you're just trying to balance memory if you don't have any like skewed nodes in the cluster. Um, so this this helped a lot actually with with getting bigger graphs loaded in the system. But the same problem is that. You know, you, you end up seeing a lot more messages than you would if you had a range-based partitioner. So range-based partitioning, you get the benefits of locality a lot of times, uh, but the downside is that now you have this issue with balancing memory, so it's kind of tricky. But, so the way we, we change this graph partitioner is that now we, we actually have a hash-based par partitioner. We also allow you to implement your own range-based partitioner based on your type. And uh, it's flexible enough so that you can actually take your ranges and like resplit them during each iteration if you wanted to. Although we don't have anything in examples right now, but the interface allows for it. So more concretely, um, this is how we do our graph distribution. So the master would decide up front, based on some user code or the default implementation, how many partitions to have. So in this case, I have eight partitions. I say, okay, and we're gonna have eight partitions, and then we assign them to workers. So worker zero is getting partition zero and one, um, and so, so on and so forth. Then these workers that have these partitions execute the compute or loading phase or storing phase, depending on where we are inside of the application. Um, and messages are sent, et cetera. Uh, and finally, at the end of the super step, they then emit, uh, not emit, that's not a good word, that's overused. So they, they generate partition statistics that are then passed to the master and use this feedback to figure out, hey, do I need to rebalance, do I need to create new partitions? Do I need to split a partition? Um, is one getting too big, for instance? Uh, and that's kind of like how our graph distribution works. And that's how we provide kind of a flexible framework for making sure that users have a, a way to get the best performance they can from the system. Okay. Um, so fault tolerance. Fault tolerance, we, we can, okay, so the thing is you can survive a lot of faults with draft. Uh, but there are costs to them. So we, we allow to basically make them very customizable to, to the needs of your system or what you see often failing. We don't actually, we can actually build a system, we, we built the system in the mind such that you don't really have a single point of failure from the draft point of view. So we have this way of having multiple masters. If one dies, another one takes over. You can specify you have more than one master in the system. Now if a worker thread dies, we have checkpointing. The checkpointing is implemented by the infrastructure itself. So we, we can dump the entire graph to, to HDFS um, and then say load it up again if we need to, if yeah, there is a failure. And so that handles failures of workers basically. With Zookeeper, you know, if, as long as we can maintain a quorum, so we say we created a three cluster Zookeeper service, then as long as you know, one, two of them remain, then the quorum can, then the application can, can continue. Uh, so it depends on your tolerance to faults, I guess, as what you want to do with draft. Um, so when I, when I run per benchmarking, for instance, I turn all this off. Uh, but if I was running a very long running job, then I might want to consider certain levels of fault tolerance that I consider acceptable. There's also a manual checkpoint restart. So if you say, for instance, your job is running in a cluster, you did do a checkpoint, and then like, boom, the job tracker dies, or the name node dies, um, then you could restart your job again manually from some whatever checkpoints we had available. Okay. So this just kind of illustrates a little, a little bit better about um, how the, how the fail, fault tolerance works. So we, we use Zookeeper to implement these like queues where we have masters and uh, one's active at a time, obviously, and then all the state for the master is stored inside of Zookeeper. And so if one dies, another one can take over. I think that's pretty straightforward. Pretty common case for Zookeeper. And to handle the worker fault tolerance, there's a notion of some periodic checkpoint in, in, in draft. Now if you implemented checkpointing every super step, it would be like, doing a map reader's job almost every time. Uh, so we probably wouldn't want to do that. And in, in this example, I'm just doing every other checkpoint, but you could specify it as you like. Uh, and the idea is if you have a failure and you can just roll back to the last good checkpoint and restart your application. So this model is also interesting in the sense that if you have this bulk synchronous parallel co computing model, you can do other things besides handle fault tolerance. I mean, yeah, failures. It may be a case in which you say, well, my cluster has like 50 free map tasks now, but maybe they'll have 100 in the next 20 minutes or something like that. So with Giraffe, you can specify a min number of workers and a max number of workers that you need for your application. And initially, you'll start with at least the min, 
And then as your application continues, after each super step, the master then rechecks to see the worker states. It says, okay, I have 50 workers, I have 100 workers now, so what can I do with that? And then what it'll do is then take those partitions from one, from one worker and then spread them out across the new workers. So you can actually kind of add resources to a running job. If you have a really long running job, then this is kind of a cool feature of Giraffe. It's not just something for fault tolerance. It also handles the failures in the sense that like, if you lose a worker, then you then can restart from the stupid uh, checkpoint um, with less workers. But it's, it's also a way to grow the, grow the application as resources become available. Some optional features uh, that we have are combiners. <coughs> so combiners are used very heavily in MapReduce as a way of saving network traffic and memory. Uh, no different for us. What we do is combine the messages that are sent, and you have to implement your own combiner algorithm. Uh, for us, combiners provide a way to help the client uh, save memory as well as save network. But I think more importantly on the server side is that you can save memory by aggregating all your messages for you. And that's typically where we run out of memory, if we are going to run out of memory. Um, client side, I mean, if you're doing totally random, uh, like hash partitioning of your graph, then your chances of finding like the same message may not be so high. So uh, for us, I think the main benefit is actually on the server side here. The other thing we have is aggregators. Aggregators provide a way for global state to be propagated uh, during the application. So for instance, you could calculate the max vertex value using this aggregator method instead. So when you iterate through your vertices, or sorry, yeah, iterate through your vertices doing the compute algorithm, you have this aggregator and you just say, I want to aggregate my vertex value. Uh, using some arrogate method that you've implemented. So it could be maximum, could be minimum, could be any, any one of those things. But um, it's a good way to do kind of like global communication automatically and monitoring statistics. The only requirement is that it's commutative and associative. So onto some new features. So uh, I mentioned this earlier, we actually changed uh, the IPC to use Netty um, because Hadoop RPC tends to fall over at billions of messages. Uh, and uh, this is a kind of a complicated graph, I know. But um, basically, uh, the, the green line is Netty performance using the page rank benchmark uh, with, I think, like number of workers times like a billion node, uh, 100 million, maybe 10 million, 10 million vertices, 10 million edges, sorry. So there's like, a, at the 10 workers point, there's 100 million edges. And in this case, messages scales with number of, of uh, uh, edges. So 100 million edges aggregate in the system, 300 million edges and 50 million edges. And uh, just, just a simple comparison between using the Netty-based implementation and the Hadoop RPC, we saw anywhere between a 10 to 39% performance improvement. And this is without really tuning. I mean, I'm, I'm not by no means a Netty expert. Uh, I just did, I just implemented something that works. Pass all the unit tests. It's, it's a lot stabler than Hadoop RPC. But I, I think with tuning, we could even get, get better than this, frankly. So uh, before the Hadoop Summit, I decided that, uh, I did have benchmarks from last year, but I decided to rerun all our benchmarks again. And um, I had a pretty sleepless weekend, I think, last weekend. Uh, so in this case, I, I was able to scrounge up 80 machines uh, from Facebook, and um, we're using the Facebook version of Hadoop available on GitHub. Uh, we, we, we have some machines with a lot of memory, and I think that's something that is really helpful when you're using Giraffe. Um, and I think I may, yeah more, than, yeah, more than 64 gigs. I think we may be using like 70 or 80 gig heaps uh, for each worker. And in this case, we're using the PageRank benchmark with five super steps, I turn off all the things that make it slow, which is checkpointing, and um, I only have one master. In this case, we're doing 10 edges per vertex. So uh, last year, I think I presented, no, actually, well, I have presented some results in the past where I've talked about like half a billion edges or half a billion nodes, something like that. So this year, I thought it'd be more interesting to go a scale higher. So we're doing up to five billion edges this time, which is, I think, more interesting and more relevant. So. Again, I have a pretty small cluster, um, but in this case, I, I think this is a run with, so the, the idea here is we have two billion edges running in, in, the, in the graph using the PageRank benchmark, and it's a PageRank algorithm. It's, again, yeah, two billion edges, and then we just change the number of workers in this case. So how does it scale with adding more workers? Um, 
I think this is due to me not being able to tune Netty properly right away and uh, running in course of a weekend. But uh, we still see some pretty good performance benefits until, I mean, until say, 40 nodes or something. And then it starts tailing off, kind of like that. Uh, OK, so the next benchmark we have here is edge scalability. Same, same thing. We're using PageRank benchmark. We're sending um, the number of edges is equal to the number of messages sent per super step. So we're talking about like a billion edges a super step. Actually, more. Yeah, sorry, times number of edges. OK. So anyway, um, so we're computing with 5 billion edges in the graph, or 500 million, 500 million nodes. Um, and I think edges are a more important case here, because I could have run a benchmark with 5 billion nodes and one edge each. It's the same, basically the same thing. Uh, and this is fixing the number of workers with 20 and showing how we can run this, run this benchmark, how does it scale, the, pro the problem size. And it's mostly linear until uh, some point around 4 to 5 billion. Okay. So this last graph here is um, pretty complicated, I think. But it's scaling up the problem size with the amount of resources that you have at the, at the same time. So the green line denotes both the workers and edges. Uh, we have between 10 and 60 workers in this, in this benchmark, and uh, how many edges we're using. So we're using between 1 to 6 billion edges. And then the blue line is the run times. So in an ideal world, if we had perfect scalability, we just have a flat line uh, for that blue line. And I think, again, because I'm not tuning things quite correctly, uh, we had slightly increased um, in run time. But still, I think overall, it, it's uh, pretty good. So some updates. Uh, as of May of this year, Apache draft in, uh, graduated the incubator. Uh, that's pretty cool. It's only been in there less than a year. And during this time, we've amassed uh, contributions from a variety of companies that are, I think, relevant here, which is like Hortonworks, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, Trend Micro. And uh, we've had a lot of engagement from universities that want to do research and also do machine learning. So um, and one thing I did left off this list, actually, unfortunately, is uh, there's a couple of Stanford uh, students that are working with as well, PhD students that are, well, actually, I will talk about that later in the future improvements. But they're doing some really cool stuff as well. We uh, rolled our first release on February of this year. And we're looking to create a .2 release soon, very soon. And uh, we want to put this in, I think there's been a request to put this in the big top and other distributions as well. So the future improvements. This is where the direction of draft is heading in the next, I don't know, couple months, I guess. First thing is we want to get out of core messaging on the graph. So again, there's this issue of skew. Like some nodes in the graph are really big. They have a lot of edges, or not, well, they have a lot of edges pointing towards them, incoming edges. And this causes problems with memory. So we need to be able to, under certain circumstances, be able to, be able to dump you know, our, our data, both messaging and probably part of the graph, to disk. And load them, and this should be, you know, degrading gracefully. It shouldn't just be like all or one. Like you have enough memory, and fine, everything runs, or you don't have memory, and everything dies. That's not good. So that's one thing that we're really looking forward to to having. The other thing is performance improvements. I think the first focus of Giraffe, first and foremost, was that we make all the features available. So we have the combiners, aggregators, we have um, uh, all, everything working, all the compute methods. It actually does stuff. Uh, when I was when I, before I left Yahoo, they're running in production for well over a year, and um, everything's going to work just fine. So ne now that we're really focused on performance. Netty, Netty is a great step. We got a lot of performance gains. We need to tune it. We also need to work on parallelizing the vertex processing on every worker. We need to figure out the right number of threads to run to to handle the um, uh, to handle the servers for Netty. I mean, there's a lot of different things we can do. And also, scale back the use of Zookeeper, perhaps, a little bit. So Zookeeper is really easy to use, so that's why we use it for everything. But it probably doesn't make sense to do certain things with Zookeeper, like storing your aggregator values there. Or um, maybe even doing coordination. I think it's probably faster for a worker just to send an any request to the master, which we can do, uh, since we do have a master. So these are some other performance improvements we're going to look at, as well as maybe improving serialization and deserialization. Um, OK, so uh, beyond performance, we're actually looking at adding, um, I guess, making new features available in the sense that there's been some really interesting work proposed by a student, uh, Sima, at Stanford. And he worked on something called GPS, which is similar to Draft, 
but I think it just came out a little bit after that. So he wanted, he wanted to add this feature into draft where you can actually also have a master computation, uh, not just a worker compute, but a master compute that happens before every super step that then can send some data to the workers and maybe change some kind of logic about the way they do their computation. <coughs> this actually helps a lot of uh, different kinds of algorithms apparently. And um, besides handling skew from the point of going out of core only, um, there's some work by another student at Stanford, uh, Bo Wang, to try to break up uh, the vertices uh, that have a lot of edges incoming, and, or outgoing, sorry, rather, in this case. And uh, the way we can do that is, um, well, he's working on it, but the way we can do that is by basically doing a, like a, another merge step at the end. We kind of merge these, um, these values together based on some a priori knowledge. Uh, and beyond that, Facebook itself has not actually um, been doing much in this space until now. And uh, we're really looking forward to um, running a lot of production algorithms on top of draft in this next quarter. We're gonna be looking very heavily into doing the label propagation uh, I talked about earlier. And comparing it to, for instance, we have some Hive implementation, but it's pretty slow. So we only like run like one, one iteration over a very small subset of our data. We would like to run the entire Facebook social graph and, and on giraffe and kind of see how, how it goes from there. So with that, uh, I'd love to take any questions. Uh, yeah, no, sorry, there are two microphones. Um, they told me you have to use them, but I don't know. Hi, I wasn't quite clear uh, the difference between input splits and partitions. Uh -huh. Are they, is there a one-to-one -one mapping between them or? Uh, absolutely not, yeah, they're, they're totally decoupled. So an input split is basically just a portion of the graph that's being loaded by right. a worker. Right. And uh, the number of partitions is determined by whatever uh, algorithm you've chosen. So I think by default, we take the number of workers and multiply and square it and then multiply it by some constant factor like 0.5 or something like that. So like the idea is that, say you had three workers, uh, we create like nine partitions I think in that case and each one gets assigned three. That way if one dies, no it's the other way around, it's like three minus one. So like the other two would go to the other two workers in case of failure basically, fault handling. So. Is uh, is, it's, the it's point, is the point that you have the same vertex and multiple splits and you want to have the no, same no, the, vertex? No, the, the, the point of uh, determining the partitioning algorithm is really as a way of, for fault tolerance. So when you lose a worker, you don't want like, if you only had one partition, you can't, you'll just give it to somebody else, but then he'll have like double the load. The idea is that you could spread the load a little bit more among the rest of the remaining workers that are still alive in the system. So that's, that's, the, that's the decoupling that I talked about. Uh, does giraffe work well with bipartite graphs? Meaning, uh, let's say you have a graph of user going to uh, movies watched. Um, so you have a set of nodes that are uh, of type user and the other set of ty uh, nodes that are of type movies. Uh, does it work well with that kind of data? Uh, I don't know anything specifically why it wouldn't work well. Um, I mean, there's been some talk, I think, about multi-graphs and stuff like that. I think maybe that's where you're referring to. Yeah. I mean, you can implement like multi-graphs on top of giraffe. We don't have any native support for it. Like, so you can have like a vertex value that's got like both the movies and the users or something like that, and then yeah. you could do whatever you want. But okay. there's no like native support for multi-graphs. Okay. But it's still possible to do, and some people do it inside of giraffe. I see. And can you do random walks on a graph? Meaning, let's say that a particular node is connected to five other nodes, and you don't want to send your message to every other five nodes that the node is connected to, but randomly select one of the node based on the weight? Um, oh, uh, I mean, yeah, you could, I mean, you, you could just implement the algorithm yourself in the compute, right? You could just say, here's my, I have my five edges, and some probability, I'm gonna send a message to this edge. I see. And then okay. send a message cool. to the very edge, yeah. Thanks. Absolutely. Yeah, so uh, my question is about um, the, the iteration in a partition. So um, in some super steps, maybe that no vertices get a message at all. Right. And can they be skipped in the iteration? Um, in other words, they wouldn't need to I change see, state. I yeah. yeah, I think I understand the question. So in some cases, the vertices don't receive messages. Do they still do the compute is what you're asking? Yeah, yeah we, we do. We still do the compute because we don't, I mean, I mean, you could just have a check at the beginning, I guess, that says if message array is empty, then exit or whatever. I mean, but would it be an optimization just not to even iterate on them? I see. Yeah. So uh, in that case, we vote, like voting to halt kind of does that, right? So if you voted to halt in the previous super step, then we skip over you. I see. 
and uh, and you won't be you won't be computing at all. Those and vertices are not computed. Is there any support for a levelized um, evaluation of a graph, a, a directed graph, like process the start points and then the next stage and so on? Um, would that be feasible <laughs> in, in the system? Uh, so I'm not sure I understand your question. Okay, so some in a directed graph, some uh, vertices don't have any edges arriving, and they would be evaluated first. Oh, then, you, like an edge, yeah. like a priority of vertice evaluation. Yeah. Uh, so doing the super step, um, there is no uh, notion of any kind of ordering on what happens first. Like, there's no ordering of like which vertices are computed before other vertices. There also are no ordering on messages that are sent, uh, and that's part of the BSP model, just in general, the framework. The idea behind that is that by doing that, you can actually parallelize it very easily, right? So I, I think that would kind of go against a little bit of what the like against the parallelization strategy. Uh, I have a question, but directly to the BSP model. Sure. The BSP model was proposed around like the 1990s. Yeah. And one of the issue people mention about, <coughs> sorry, is about the long -term path, which means there are some workers run particularly slower. Yes. And in each super step, you need to wait. Even you got 1,000 or even 10,000 workers, if they are one got slow, Absolutely. everybody need to wait. That's correct. So how to grab to handle that or just ignore that? Uh, so. That can be, well, that can be mitigated a bit by how you do your partitioning of the graph. If you know certain vertices, vertices take longer, the way you partition your graph can be such that those vertices are maybe put together or um, maybe they're whatever their number of vertices on that particular partition are less. But yeah, it's a, it's a difficult problem to solve. The one way I think that we're investigating in draft is how to do asynchronous graph processing. So if we, if we take this BSP model and then like relax it, like yeah. and there's a lot of other work that's similar to this, but you could do it in an asynchronous model where you kind of like, you send some messages, they'll be delivered sometime, and they'll be processed sometime, but there's no like, it's, everything's asynchronous. And that kind of handles that case, I think, very nicely. But at the same time, it's, it's not well determined, it's very non-deterministic, and it's um, a little hard to reason about right. uh, sometimes, yeah. So we'll look into it as well. Oh, I'm, I'm, I, okay, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm over time, but uh, thank you very much. And I'll be here if you have any more questions later.